Hi everybody. Welcome to our presentation on the resurrection. The resurrection is the fundamental Christian faith that Jesus conquered death. Paul described it as the citadel of Christian faith. And so we want to take a look today at the meaning of the experience of the resurrection. Um, the resurrection of the dead. Our presentation this morning will deal with the phenomena of death. And of course in our second presentation on the spirit world we talked a lot about this experience of death is something that we will all experience in that we've all been born. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and Matthew 27.52 bear testimony of the experience of resurrection. But one thing that we can see as we examine the scripture is that there are two kinds of life and two kinds of death. If we look at Jesus' words in Luke 9.60, he said, leave the dead to bury their own dead, indicating that there are two kinds of death. There is spiritual death and there is physical death. Physical death is the death of the physical body. Spiritual death is a different kind of death. And we really want to make sure when we're talking about resurrection coming from death into life that we have a clear understanding of the type of death that we are referring to. So when Jesus said let the dead bury the dead he meant let the spiritual dead those that are dead spiritually let them bury the physical dead and you, you come follow me so that you may have life. So you have the name of being alive and you are dead. Words of Revelation 3.1. Again indicating that when we're talking about life and death we're not just talking about the life and death of the physical body. We see in the 11th chapter of John the 25th and 26th verse. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So though he die, in other words, though he die physically, don't worry about that because you will live spiritually. We have a spiritual life as well as a temporal physical life. So the next important question would be then we have two types of life, two types of death, then what type of death was caused by the fall of man? And ultimately it will help us to understand what really, it, what life is the object of resurrection? Coming from death into life, is that referring to uh, physical life, physical death, or spiritual life, spiritual death. That's what we really want to look at. And I think we have to um, go back to our second presentation on the spiritual world. The section where we talked about the structure and function of a human. How did God construct a human being? And we studied that God made a physical body and a spiritual body and that our spirit body and physical body relate together and that this relationship, this integration of spirit and body really uh, we refer to as a microcosm of the cosmos, of the macrocosm, the spiritual world and the physical world. So we talked about a temporal integration between the two bodies. So Genesis 2.17 mentions that on the day they eat of the fruit they will die. Well they didn't die physically. Uh, there must have been uh, another type of death 
on the very day they ate the fruit. Likewise, we see that Paul testifies to a spiritual body and a natural body. If there's a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. The natural body goes back to the dust, and the spirit is the body that is raised. Ecclesiastes 12.7 says that um, uh, the, the body goes back into the soil, the spirit returns to God who gave it. So, um, what, what then is the meaning of resurrection? We know resurrection means returning from death into life. And if, in fact, the death caused by the fall was not the physical death, but was spiritual death, then we have to have a clear understanding of what then resurrection means. Because then resurrection must mean passing from death into life is passing from spiritual death into spiritual life. The next natural question would then be, what is spiritual death? What then is spiritual death? So how would we define spiritual death? We could say a very simple definition would be uh, spiritual life is relationship with God. It's uh, as Jesus said, uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by hearing every word of the Father. So being within God's sanctified dominion would be spiritual life. And falling outside that realm of God's dominion into Satan's dominion would be then spiritual death. Uh, we see in uh, 1 Corinthians 15.22 As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And also we see in Romans uh, chapter 5, 12 to 17, by one man's sin entered the world. By one man sin entered the world. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. So again we're talking about spiritual death caused by sin. Look at, um, and again, uh, continuing with Romans. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned. Even over them that had not committed their own sin, but they had inherited the climate, the condition of sin, through their natural ancestry, their link to the dead Adam. And then we look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. Romans 8, 6, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And we also see in Ephesians 4, 18, Ephesians 4.18 tells us that they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Due to the hardening of their hearts. And remember earlier Jesus said all iniquity, all sin ultimately originates in this corrupted and hardened heart. So that's why we are separated from the life of God. This is a spiritual separation. So therefore the meaning of resurrection is leaving the domain of Satan's sovereignty and his death and the claim that he has over us. Again, something that is even beyond our own committed acts. Satan has a claim over the entire lineage of the dead Adam. Leaving that realm and entering into the realm of God's love, God's dominion and life. That is the process of resurrection. We see in 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. So again, our 
the result of passing from death into life is that our hearts are no longer hardened. Our hearts have been cleansed and we're able to love the brethren with a new and clean heart. That's the evidence that we have passed from death into life. And also we see in John 5, 24, He who hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. And he does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. So we see that ultimately it is the relationship with Christ that is the channel of passing from spiritual death into spiritual life. So we can see because there's two kinds of life and two kinds of death, it's very easy, very easy to get spiritual and corporal resurrection confused. We have examples of spiritual resurrection, which is really the, the providential resurrection that Christ brings and is the exclusive agent of that providential resurrection. But we also see examples of corporal resurrection, which stands as a miracle. And we see evidence of it in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. So we want to make sure that we can make a clear distinction between the providential resurrection brought by Christ as the exclusive agent and the uh, miracle of corporal resurrection uh, of which we see some very clear and well-known examples in Matthew 27:52, The tombs were opened and the many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This is thought to be corporal resurrection. But let's look at this. The bodies were raised, they appeared to many, but not to all. Also, there's no uh, record, historical record, of the saints actually appearing to everyone. This is some evidence that this was a phenomena of spiritual resurrection, because whereas they did appear to many, they did not appear to all. And of course, if they had been corporally resurrected, certainly everyone would have been able to experience them. This was a spiritual phenomena that took place. How about John eleven thirty eight forty four? Lazarus is raised from the dead. This is definitely corporal. This is definitely a corporal resurrection. Uh, no doubt about this. Lazarus' body was in the tomb and Jesus called him out. He said, Lazarus, get up. And Lazarus came out of the tomb. However, is this really an example of the providential resurrection? Passing from spiritual death into spiritual life? No, this is not an example of um, providential resurrection. And Jesus explains in John uh, 10.38 that this is a miracle. The reason I'm doing this is that you may believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If you don't believe my words, believe the works. So this is a miracle. This is a work. This event of corporal resurrection is a miracle. And um, how about Jesus' resurrection? We see, he says, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. <laughs> well, Jesus was in his glorified body. We see that the uh, apostles were in a room, the windows were shut, the door was shut, and Jesus appeared in their midst, and they were startled, thinking that he was a ghost. And uh, in the uh, uh, King James Version, um, a ghost, actually it's different in the King James Version, in the New International Version. In the New International Version, ghost is a negative term. In the uh, uh, King James Version, ghost is a positive term. 
in the uh, King James Version, spirit, thinking they've seen a spirit, is a negative, like apparition. And that's why they were scared. New International Version, ghost is like a low-level apparition, a spirit. And it induced fear. And Jesus was seeking to ally their fears. He said, touch my flesh and bones. Well, doesn't that wrap it up that that was his uh, natural body? No, it was the body that was raised, the spiritual body. That they could touch that body doesn't mean that it was his natural body. Because uh, we see, for example, angels uh, ate a meal with Lot. Um, Jacob wrestled an angel. So being able to touch the uh, spiritualized body of Christ doesn't mean it was the natural body. So Jesus' resurrection uh, is ultimately the resurrection of his glorified body. And... um, We see uh, also some very interesting evidence related to um, how he appeared. Mark 16, 14, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meal and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe them which had seen him after he was risen. No, they didn't recognize him. Their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Again, this was Jesus' glorified body. Mark 16, 12, he appeared in a different form. Different form than how they knew him in his earthly natural body. Jesus was now appearing in his glorified body. Now that doesn't mean uh, that when they went to the tomb in his his natural body was gone, it doesn't mean that that didn't get up and and walk out. Because, of course, we know that it did. Certainly Jesus had authority over his own body. The point here is that the appearance of Jesus after that miracle is the appearance of his glorified, spiritualized body. And sometimes we get the two confused. 1 Corinthians 15.48 um, who saw him? Paul gives a, uh, a running account of all those that saw Jesus after his resurrection. Who saw him? Peter, the apostles, and 500 others. He gives a, a running uh, account of all those that experienced the appearance of Christ after his resurrection. And he concludes by saying, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Paul, last of all, in this series of appearances, Jesus then appeared to me. Now, how did Jesus appear to Paul? In Acts 9, 3 to 7, as Paul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city. You'll be told what you must do. And here's the key phrase. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard a sound, but they did not see anyone. This is how Jesus appeared to Paul. Meaning that Paul could see him, but the men standing right next to him could not see him. Very similar to uh, the 27th chapter of Matthew where the many bodies of the saints were raised and they appeared to many but not to all. In other words, the person that they appeared to, the person standing next to him, didn't necessarily see the saints, the resurrected saints. So a lot of it has to do with those that were anointed and chosen and had the eyes to see this non-physical, spiritualized phenomena of resurrection. They did not see anyone, but Paul did. He saw Jesus with his spiritual eye. So can a physical body appear and disappear? I don't think so. Can it appear in a different form? No, the, the uh, physical body is physical, and it 
dies and deteriorates and goes back into the soil. Can it be invisible to some and visible to others? No. We know that that is not possible. Then uh, how about a spiritualized body? What are the capabilities of a spiritualized body? Can it eat food? A spiritual body? Yeah. Lots of uh, uh, experience with the angels. Um, can it be touched? Certainly uh, Jacob uh, touched the angel. Uh, we cite those examples there in scripture. So this shows us clearly that Jesus' appearance uh, after the miracle of his corporal resurrection was in his spiritualized body. See, they thought they had seen a ghost and they were terrified. So Jesus was allying their fears to assure them that it was indeed him. Albeit in his spiritualized body, but it was certainly Jesus. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 35 to 44, there are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, spiritual bodies and physical bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So also is the resurrection of the dead. See here? It is sown a natural body and it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So this really sheds a lot of light on the two types of resurrection. The resurrection, the providential resurrection of the spirit and the resurrection of the corporal body uh, being a miracle. Uh, the spirit is, uh, resurrection of the spirit is confirmed by 1 Corinthians 15, 42 and 44. Um, the uh, saints that were raised in Matthew 27, 52. And uh, the example of the corporal body, Jesus raising Lazarus and also um, um, uh, Elijah raising the dead. Do you know that? Elijah raised the dead in 1 Kings 17, 21 to 22. Elijah ra raised a young boy who had passed away and brought his spirit back into his body and he was raised exactly in the same way that Lazarus was raised. So the raising of the corporal body is a miracle. It is a miracle and it is a miracle that is not exclusive to Christ. Obviously Elijah raised the dead and it's a, a, a tremendous miracle but uh, it's not exclusive to Christ. Whereas Christ is absolutely the exclusive agent of the resurrection of the spirit. Nobody can pass from death to life. When we talk about the providence of resurrection, of, of leaving Satan's dominion and coming into the dominion of God's life, nobody can do that. No prophet, no, no uh, anybody cannot do that except exclusively uh, Christ who is the sole agent of the providence of resurrection, returning from death to life. So that should be our focus then when we um, understand the dispensation of resurrection, that we're talking about a spiritual phenomenon. Uh, we can see another interesting scripture in Luke 16, 19 to 31. Jesus talks about um, the term raising from the dead. What does that mean? We know raising from the dead in the corporal manifestation of Lazarus and the young man who was raised. But how about an example of raising from the dead in a spiritualized way? And uh, we look at the parable that Jesus gives of the rich man and Lazarus. This is a different Lazarus who is the servant of the rich man. This is not the Lazarus that Jesus raised corporally. And it's kind of interesting that we have a Lazarus here who is being raised spiritually. So we have a Lazarus who is an example of corporal resurrection and Jesus gives us a second Lazarus who is an example of spiritual resurrection. He answered them, 
Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. This is the rich man who died and went to hell. And he's calling out to Father Abraham. He can see Father Abraham on, on, uh, in a good place in the spiritual realm. And, and uh, his servant, Lazarus, is standing next to him. And the rich man calls out to Abraham and says, I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to those prophets. No, Father Abraham, the rich man said. But if someone from the dead, someone from the dead, goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone raises from the dead. Wow. What does it mean, raising from the dead? It means Lazarus, who is in the spiritual world, who, uh, who has been buried, but whose spiritualized body is raised and existing, standing next to Abraham in the spiritual world. Certainly we see later that Moses and Elijah, their spiritualized body appears with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So here is Lazarus in the spiritual world. Here's the rich man who was also had his natural body buried, but his spiritualized body is in hell. And he's calling out to Abraham, who is up there. And between him and hell and Abraham and Lazarus, Up there, there's a separation. And Abraham tells him, we can't go down there where you are, and you can't come up here where we are. And the rich man says, send Lazarus back to the earth. Now that's not talking about reincarnation, but it's talking about Lazarus as a spiritual body, a spiritualized body, appearing to the rich man's brothers to warn them. And Abraham says, well, you know, that doesn't work because if they uh, aren't going to listen to Moses and the prophets, they would not listen, even if that happened, even if Lazarus raised from the dead. So what is resurrection? Resurrection also involves spiritual beings in the spiritual world appearing and cooperating with us on earth. It's another manifestation of resurrection. And therefore, in order to understand resurrection, we need to understand clearly the principles behind resurrection. Again, we're not talking about the miracle of corporal resurrection here. We're talking about the providence of resurrection leaving spiritual death and entering into providential eternal life, spiritual life. Principle number one, the Word. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. The Word is the foundation of spiritual resurrection, of returning to life, out of death. So God gives His Word if we make the condition to obey that Word and to put that Word into practice... (coughs) Then we have passed from death into life. That's why Jesus said, He who hears my word will not be judged. He who receives it, unites with it, puts it into practice, will not be judged. He will have passed from death into life. Secondly, we need a physical body. In other words, just as James said, faith without works is dead. We have to receive God's word, believe it, and then Jesus tells us we have to put it into practice. And that's really the purpose of our life on earth. It's our time to really build our relationship with God, to perfect the love that he has placed within us. So we need a physical body to accomplish that relationship that, remember in our presentation on the spiritual world, we talked about the spiritual protein 
We need all grace to abound to us. And God will give us that spiritual protein as we make the decision to live for others. Grace abounds to the cheerful giver, Paul tells us in the uh, ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians. All grace abounds to us who makes the decision in his heart to give. And of course, God has placed his love in us and has given us the mandate to receive his word and to grow and perfect this love. And so that's really our earthly responsibility. That's why we're here. That's why we have this temporal integration of spirit and body so that we can actually perfect God's love and then merge with God and become perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Once we've accomplished that, we're ready to go. (laughs) We don't need this physical body anymore. As a matter of fact, it'll hold us back. So if we've accomplished this life relationship with God, we've perfected his love and we're perfect and mature as God is perfect and mature, then our body will no longer be needed and our spirit returns to God and perfected, perfected as a perfected spirit. And the body, having fulfilled its role, goes back into the soil. Just like the placenta You know, once a baby is born, the placenta is just a useless tissue mass, and it goes back to the dust. Uh, This is what we studied in our second presentation. The temporal integration of spirit and body uh, serves a function, and once that purpose is accomplished, then the spirit returns to God, and the body returns to dust. That's a second principle of the principle of resurrection. And our third principle is that it involves three stages. Three stages of growth uh, from the level of form spirit to life spirit to divine spirit. And we can see basically in God's providence that uh, there are three major stages. We go from an Old Testament to a New Testament to the completed testament or the, the foundation of the chosen people and the law the coming of Jesus in Israel and opening up the channel of regeneration on the day of Pentecost and then we wait for Christ to return and to bring his kingdom and uh, that is the time when Satan is thrown into the lake of fire and God's original purpose is realized so we see three major stages in this historical process to uh, 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 a man's journey from death, out of death, into life. And our fourth uh, um, principle is related to that, and that is that there is a historical process. Age benefits. That means as over time, more resurrection is available. For example, if you were born 100 years after the fall of man, not really much opportunity for you to resurrect. However, if you were born at the time of Jesus, it's a much more opportune moment in human history. That is, if you were born in Israel. If you were born uh, in uh, my hometown in North Carolina 2,000 years ago, probably for you it's not going to be a meritorious age because Christ's love's not going to get to you in your lifetime. So as time goes on, God's love becomes more available. And as God's love becomes more available, more reachable, uh, then more resurrection is available. So generally, this age benefit principle, the time of history in which you appear, will determine the amount of uh, benefit or how much spiritually you can resurrect and come back and be closer to God. So we see a general uh, increase over time. Um, So we studied the death of one man, uh, the death of Adam. And Adam died based on conditions. Uh, So God's resurrection providence begins in the lowest realm. Adam fell below the formation stage in a realm where even God could not touch him. And that's why this time period 
is first 2,000 years of God's providence, a foundation for resurrection from Adam's family to Abraham's family. We see that there was really no codified word uh, of God given to man. And typically, the providential people could only relate to God through very external rituals and conditions, like animal sacrifices. Abel had to offer an animal sacrifice. Abraham was called to make an animal sacrifice, eventually even having to offer his son. When Abraham and Isaac bonded in that faith, we see that the need for blood was superseded in that moment. And there's a very deep lesson there because we will see henceforth, wherever there's this bond of faith, it will supersede the providential need for bloodshed. So this beginning pre-stage, formation stage for resurrection involved the providential people making conditions of faith through conditional objects, animal sacrifices. And then uh, centering on uh, Jacob's victory and Israel extended to the national level in the beginning of the Old Testament age with Moses. We see that uh, Israel made a foundation for God's word to be returned. And this really kickstarts the dynamic resurrection process because again our first principle is the word. When man gets the word, the word is life itself. So when we receive the word and believe it and put it into practice, the resurrection process is truly energized, a process from spiritual death into spiritual life. So uh, that's why we see in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy that uh, God said, if you keep the law, you will have life. If you reject the laws and decrees and commandments, you will have death blessing, curse, um, depending on maintaining the law. So we look at that as the Old Testament age. And through keeping the law, uh, God's people could achieve what we would refer to as the form level, the basic first foundation of resurrection, and could become a form spirit in the process of resurrection. This is the formation stage. Then we move on to the next foundation of the New Testament age, centering on Jesus. And this was the accomplishment of life. Man could become a life spirit. Not just through receiving the Word, but through receiving the Word made flesh. And through the channel of regeneration, which was opened up on the day of Pentecost, then we could come out of uh, a deeper dimension of death into a deeper dimension of life and enter into paradise and stand as a life spirit in paradise. This was the next level of resurrection. And then we all are waiting for the return of Christ. Christ is coming again. And we see that Christ will come to bring the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Jesus says that he will grant us the right to eat from the tree of life which was lost the potentiality that was lost in the garden of Eden by Adam and God placed a cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to block the way to the tree of life so that which was lost by Adam is restored finally at the second coming of Christ. And we see in Revelation 21.1 that the new heaven and the new earth will come to a new Jerusalem and God will wipe away every tear. God will be our God. We will be his people. The uh, devil will be thrown in the lake of fire. And so the kingdom of heaven, new heaven, new earth will be established. Uh, we could call that the completed testament age. The era of the second coming of Christ where all mankind will be God's direct sons and daughters and as such we will be divine sons and daughters of God. So that's the historical process of uh, resurrection. On the Old Testament age we're justified by law. On the New Testament age as adopted children we're justified by faith. And in the completed Testament age as true children, we will be justified by direct attendance 
God will be our God. We will be his people. There will be no other claim upon us. For the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire. So we will have a direct and uh, exclusive relationship with the true God, the true creator of humanity. Um, So let's take a look at the issue of heaven and paradise. Is there a difference? Jesus told the thief on the uh, right hand side, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so uh, is there a difference between paradise and heaven? And yes, we could say there is because God's providence is not completed until Christ comes again. And that's when the new heaven and the new earth will be instituted. So uh, until then, all the saints, all the uh, uh, martyrs of the New Testament age are in a sense uh, in waiting for that final gate to be opened so that we can all enter in to the kingdom of heaven, the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem and become divine spirits. Uh, We see scripture, Revelation 21, 1, testifying to that. 1 Peter 1, 5 says that we are, um, you know, that uh, we are shielded with God's power until the coming of the salvation that is to be revealed in the last days. And of course, that's the mission of the second coming of Christ. And we are waiting for Christ to return to do that mission. What about spiritual phenomena in the last days? A lot of spiritual phenomena out there. And of course, uh, uh, John, the book of John, 1 John chapter 4 tells us in the uh, first and third verse that we need to test the spirits. Not every spirit that says they're from God is from God. But we have to test the spirit to validate it. It doesn't mean also to just cut off from the spiritual world. As we can see, many great saints, many great figures in the scripture were communicated to from the spirit world. Joseph had a dream. Uh, Many times angels will appear and give uh, a message. So we shouldn't be cut off from the spiritual world. Acts 2.17 talks about uh, dreams and visions in the last days that uh, Uh, Young men and old men will be having dreams and visions. And we know that God does nothing without revealing his work, his purpose through his servants, the prophets. So a a total moratorium against spiritual input is not good. But neither is just being totally open to whatever comes down. So we have to be cautious. We have to uh, judge the spirit, uh, judge the angels. We have to assess based on uh, biblical parameters, but also we shouldn't just have a hardened heart to um, some great revelation or dream or vision that comes from the spiritual world. Uh, What about this returning resurrection that Jesus referred to with regard to Lazarus? What what is up with that? Well, as we studied, we, you know, we live on earth is really an integration of two worlds while we're on earth in our physical body our spirit and body are integrated and the spiritual world and the physical world really are linked centering on one person living on earth on each person (laughs) and so through our actions on earth that grace returns to our spiritual body and is like protein for our spirit and our spirit grows. So for a person in the spiritual world to continue their journey and their development and their growth, they have to cooperate with people on earth. And so this is one manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, uh, like we saw with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah were cooperating with Jesus while he was on earth. Likewise, spirits, good spirits, will cooperate with us and try to direct us towards righteous acts, to do good, to live unselfishly. And if we act in that manner based on their inspiration, then the grace that returns to us, likewise, will return to that spirit that inspired us. And uh, as a result, 
a spirit that didn't receive all that was promised, can continue his growth in the spiritual world. Just as we saw Abraham and Lazarus in the spiritual world, of course we know they went there before the channel of regeneration opened on the day of Pentecost. And we see in the 11th chapter of Hebrews that uh, the writer lists a whole array of great saints who were justified by faith but did not receive what was promised. But God had a plan for them that apart from us they would not be made perfect. Only together with us would they be made perfect. So that's really testifying to this process of returning resurrection. That saints in the spiritual world cooperate with us on earth. And that's one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Jude 1.14 says that the Lord came with his holy myriads. Many spirits were uh, with him, cooperating with him. And we've already rendered Luke 16 talking about uh, Lazarus. And uh, this verse here, raising from the dead. Raising from the dead is Lazarus coming from the spiritual world, appearing and cooperating to assist people on earth to go in the right direction. That's not the preferred route for people on earth. The preferred route is principle number one. Receive the word, put it into practice. And so if we're not willing to do that, then even someone raising from the dead, appearing to us, is not going to work. However, if we have the the principles of resurrection down, centering on God's Word, then the saints from heaven will be able to bond with us and cooperate with us on earth. That's why around us, if we are really uh, in sync with those principles of of, uh, resurrection, around us is a just a, uh, a myriad of Holy Spirits that are cooperating with us. So again, what is the motive of those spirits there in the spiritual world? They haven't received all that was promised. So they have unaccomplished responsibilities and they have not received everything. So they still have a little bit of emptiness in their tank. They're not yet perfected. They're not yet fully mature. Because maybe they they died before Christ could come. And so what do they do? They return and cooperate with earthly people whose spiritual self and physical self is still interacting, still integrated. You know, the, uh, the unselfish acts, the return of grace is still... A dynamic here. This spirit that doesn't have a physical body and so can't get that input of grace and nurturing then will cooperate with a person on the earth. And by cooperating with that person on the earth then that spirit in the spirit world can gain a portion of the grace that the person on earth is receiving through this dynamic. That's the process of how a spirit in the spiritual world can complete and receive what was promised, can be perfected as we are perfected, not apart from us, but together with us, which is Hebrews 11, chapter, verse rather, 39 and 40, talks about that point, that uh, God had a way, a plan, God devises a way for people in the spiritual world to be perfected with us, not apart from us, by cooperating with us on earth. And you might feel that. You might feel the presence of an ancestor working with you. And the more you become sensitive to that, the more amazed you'll see to find the presence of these saints in the spiritual world. And conversely, we always want to make sure we um, we attract the the saints We want to attract the saints. And by all means, we don't want to attract the ain'ts, which is uh, the spirits in hell. We want to attract the saints. These are the demons. These are the saints. The determining factor is, what is our focus? 
Do we have a grace dynamic happening here? If we do, then we'll attract the saints because they'll want to cooperate with us. However, if we're living just for the flesh, how much we can drink, how much we can eat, how much sex we can have, then we're going to attract the ain'ts. The demons, what do they want? These are the people who, when they were on earth, they just lived for the flesh. They didn't grow spiritually. They didn't develop their heart. They just lived for the flesh. Now, when their moment comes and they lose their physical body, what do they do? They don't go where God is. They don't have love and that quality, so it doesn't take them where God is. And as a matter of fact, they lose their physical body, and yet the physical desire is intensified as a spirit. Because the spirit world is the place of heightened sensitivity. So that's why they're in torment. They want to drink, but they don't have a body. They want to have sex, but they don't have a body. They want to have every kind of physical sensation, but they don't have a body. So where are they going to go? Look out. They're coming this way. Because you got what they want. So if you're focused on the flesh, you're going to attract the ain'ts. If you're focused on the life, the word, and the spirit, you'll attract the saints. Let's attract the saints, not the ain'ts. So uh, in the providence of uh, resurrection on earth, we see that you know, there are many Old Testament saints in the spiritual world that during the time of Jesus, when Jesus was on earth, they descended upon the earth and cooperated with Jesus and his apostles on the earth, like Elijah and Moses, we saw, appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's the meaning of Matthew 27. When Jesus resurrected, then the tomb was opened, and the many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. This was a spiritual event because Jesus opened up the next level out of the Old Testament age into the life level, paradise, the New Testament age. And likewise, all those Old Testament saints could elevate to the next level. Abraham, Moses, Elijah could join with Jesus in that process of resurrection. This, prof, uh, this providence will take place again at the second coming. Now all of this level, this is, um, we see in uh, uh, the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation that the second coming of Christ is coming and the armies of heaven were following him. And so again, there'll be a descend upon the earth plane of the Old and New Testament saints who are on this level. They will cooperate on earth. The holy myriads of the Lord will cooperate with the providence of the second coming. And when the final resurrection takes place, the 144,000, which represents all the tribes on earth, then these great Old and New Testament saints will likewise elevate into the kingdom of heaven in spirit. Again, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. Uh, is talking about that. Together with us, they will be made perfect. What about no marriage in heaven? A lot of misunderstanding about this. Matthew 22, 23 and 32. It seems to be that Jesus is saying there's no marriage in heaven. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So, oh yeah, we uh, till death do us part. And um, then when we die, we separate. We go back to dating. We go back to being bachelors. We go back to being single. It seems to be saying that. Uh, and that's the foundation of the marriage vow, till death do us part. But is that what Jesus really meant? Look, he said at the resurrection. He didn't say in the spiritual world. He didn't say in heaven. He said at the resurrection. And of course, they'll be like the angels in heaven. And people make a connection. Well, angels are single. So uh, that means we'll be single in heaven. But we'll be like the angels in heaven. Not because we'll be single. But as we see in Luke 20, 27 to 38. We'll be like the angels for we will never die. So our similarity to the angels is not single like the angels. But that we'll be eternal like the angels in heaven. And as far as uh, 
uh, not marrying, uh, that's only at the resurrection. And keep in mind, the resurrection culminates with eating from the tree of life. And if you'll recall, eating from the tree of life was the prerequisite for Adam and Eve to be fruitful, eat from the tree of life, then they could multiply. So that was the prerequisite for Adam and Eve to come together as husband and wife and to produce the very lineage of God. So that resurrection uh, process must be completed. That is the, uh, that is the uh, uh, meaning of this, um, the, what the scripture is saying here. So through this resurrection historical process, we return to the tree of life that was lost. This tree of life is returned in Revelation 2, 7. That we eat from the tree of life. Once we eat from the tree of life, then true marriage is opened up. And what is the evidence of true marriage? The evidence of true marriage is that when man and woman come together as husband and wife, their son, their daughter is born as a godly seed, as a direct descendant of the single God. God will be our God, we will be his people, the devil will be thrown in the lake of fire. There will be no sovereignty of Satan anymore passing through the blood lineage. Therefore true marriage, true marriage will be accomplished and true marriage will be eternal. So ultimately salvation will entail uh, not only the individual conquering death, but also marriage conquering death, the family conquering death, and surviving the transition from this world to the next. That becomes the foundation of culture, not only in the physical world, but also in the spiritual world. And also then, Christ as the central figure stands as the central figure of all religions. These SP, spiritual persons, the spirits, the saints, Muslim saints, Jewish saints, Christian saints, Buddhist saints, Confucian and Hindu saints, on various levels in the spiritual world, will descend and cooperate with their uh, descendants on the earth to move all religious figures towards unity centering on Christ. That's a little bit controversial for a lot of people. It's not saying that you know, any way is fine, not saying that at all, but it's really emphasizing that Christ is the central figure. Just as the first people who attended Jesus in Israel were neither Jew nor Christian, were probably Zoroastrian, the Magi. It shows that God so loved the world that he gave his son. So Christ is a central figure in the fulfillment of all religious traditions. Not everything that calls itself a religion, but God is certainly working through other religions to bring all together, centering on uh, the figure of Christ. So this means that we have a great hope for the resurrection. The culmination of the process of resurrection, brothers and sisters, is the return of Christ and the establishment of his kingdom. The new heaven, the new earth, where there will be weeping and wailing no more. No more sin, no more death. The devil will be thrown into the lake of fire. And God's love will reign. He will be our God, we will be his people. We will be fruitful, we will multiply, we will have dominion. And our loves, our families, our marriages, no more till death do us part. But all our loves will survive the transition from this world to the next. And we can look forward to a great realm of joy and happiness forever and ever. Thank you for listening to this presentation. And I hope it's been helpful to you. And I hope that you'll stick around and listen to the next part of the Divine Principle. Thank you.